let's start at the beginning. Uh, gentlemen, we need to compare Ansible and, uh, and Terraform. Um, we we want to understand exactly how they do and, and what they work, how, you know, what this word of item potency and, uh, and fact gathering, and there's adapters and, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, how are they the same and how are they different? Uh, Josh, maybe let's start with you here. If you want to kind of give us the, the, the framework that Ansible works within and how it interacts with network devices, that seems like a good place to start. Yeah, definitely. So uh, I think a little bit goes back in history around Ansible and how it got started. Um, this, we're going back to the days when Chef and Puppet were just being introduced, but Ansible came along, was automating Linux devices over SSH. And so along came the question about, hey, can we automate network devices? As network engineers, we don't like running various agents on our network devices, but we all SSH into the CLI. Long live the CLI, right? <laughs> and so with a little bit of work, Ansible then was started to be adapted to be able to automate network devices. And it's been a long journey since as far as Ansible goes. And that's probably Josh, about four years ago. Yeah, I have a memory that Ansible as a, as, a, as a company, a group of developers, didn't really want to get into the network automation space originally, but they, uh, they, they decided and came over to the dark side, as it were. Is my memory right there? That's my understanding as well. I don't have any specifics on that, but by being able to give us a framework, and Ansible really, some people like to compare it to programming languages, and it's not really a programming language. It's an automation engine or an automation framework. So you, I think you hit on it in the intro just right. You send, here's some configuration, what you want to send to the device, and you put that into uh, the domain-specific language of Ansible and it goes ahead and deploys that out to the network devices over the SSH channel. And some, it's also a nice bridge between your old CLI format and modules that support the new APIs that we are all hoping that network devices adopt coming up, so. Now, you, you said it, you know, we've, you've got this bit of configuration and then it sends it out to the device, but it does it in an intelligent way. That is, if there's a configuration that exists on that device, it's going to send that network configuration in such a way that it's not going to clobber what's there. It's going to, well, it might clobber what's there if it's not supposed to be there. But the whole idea is you're going to end up with a known state, uh, a known configuration on that device when Ansible is done doing its work. Correct, in a sense, and there's some variations as well. With the new network modules that just came out for the big three vendors, they support different states where you, hey, I want to go ahead and deploy VLAN 10 out to all the all your switches. It will go, and you just put in the configuration of VLAN 10, it deploys it. Otherwise, there's a new state that will actually, that's a little more declarative in nature, that will say, if I only send VLAN 10, it will go ahead and clobber all the other VLANs, which, so <laughs> when you're using that state, you definitely need to be conscious about what you're doing and not just deploy out to your data center core with that. Okay, but the, the big but yeah. deal here is there is this intelligence baked into it where there is some awareness Ansible has of what is Yep. in existence on the switch and it does deploy mm -hmm. configurations in that context. It's not just blindly shoving commands into the device. Correct. It's going to do a show run as to get the current state of the device. And then it's going to look to see, do I actually need to push this or make sure that's item potent. So it will mm -hmm. only push the changes that are needed. If you push VLAN 10 to the same switch 15 times over, and you didn't have it at the start, the first time it should deploy that config, the other times it should not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so Ned, let's flip over to you and let's get that same kind of baseline context for Terraform, how it works and how it would interact with network devices. Sure. Yeah. So very similar to the way that Ansible works, Terraform does not have an agent. It's not running an agent on any remote devices or anything like that. So it needs a way of pushing configuration and validating whether that configuration has been applied. And it is item potent the same way that Ansible is. So if you push a configuration and that configuration already matches what your destination has, then no changes are made. It just moves on to the next thing. Some of the, so Terraform doesn't SSH into devices. That's now not how it interacts. Its expectation is that there's going to be a plugin for that specific resource and provider type. So this is where we get sort of on the cloudier side of things. The assumption is, 
a provider has been written for whatever that resource is. Let's say, you know, we're dealing with AWS and VPCs. So there's already a provider for AWS. And within that provider, you have a VPC defined in all of the subnet objects and stuff like that. Terraform is going to take that and use the API that exists for AWS to check on the status and make changes. So it's not SSHing into anything, it's doing everything via an API. So there's that presumption that that API exists. So in the Terraform model, then the plugin is the magic. It's the middleman, it's the, the proxy, the translator that is abstracting Terraform commands into whatever the device specific well, I guess you say Terraform doesn't SSH, but I'm assuming the plugin would SSH maybe. Potentially, yes. And there would have to be a way for it to do that because generally Terraform just wants to make HTTP calls. So you'd need something in there that's going to make that secondary call because that's just not how Terraform generally works. Mm -hmm. The magic provider is either written by third parties or written by the fine folks at HashiCorp. And now they've expanded it. Before, it was sort of a closed ecosystem. You could write your own and load your own providers, uh, but it was harder to get custom providers outside of their ecosystem. They've now expanded that, that the provider ecosystem is available online and you can you know, pull whatever provider you need and people can write their own. I checked uh, today and there's one for Fortinet. There's one for Cisco ASAs. And mm -hmm. there's... I think there's a community one for maybe Juniper. So there's uh -huh. definitely some providers out there for physical networking devices. It's funny. One of the things that strikes me, because I'm not a real Ansible or Terraform expert, so I'm going to come at this from the point of view of somebody who's looking back at this. When Ansible and Terraform first popped up, I remember the vendors flatly refusing to get involved and saying, we're not going to write providers for these platforms because and what it boiled down to was, wow, 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 we want the profit. We don't want to have to put the work in. <laughs> and um, that's actually what it was, you know. But they used to say like, oh, well, we don't, uh, we don't know which one of these is going to be successful. We don't know uh, which, which, you know, we can't support them all. We can only support one of them. So therefore, we're, we, we're going to wait and see if anybody actually uses these. Tech. So what you're saying, I think, indirectly is that most of the vendors and now supporting tools like Ansible and Terraform substantially. Right. I, I would go so far as to say they had their own management suites that they really wanted you to use because those were licensed and, licensed and expensive. And mm. Terraform and Ansible are ostensibly free. I mean, there's a paid version of them, but you can use mm. the open source version. And uh, I, I would say that networking companies and other vendors weren't super happy about that. But now that they've seen that the DevOps engineers and network engineers and everybody had jumped on and really embraced it, they're like, well, I guess we have to now. Or mm. a commu someone in the community has written it for them. Mm. Yeah, and I, th I mean, that's interesting, right? In the sense that um, there was a time just a few years ago, five or six years ago, when the vendors wanted to do their SDN platforms. They didn't want other people's SDN platforms getting into the market. And looking back, it's easy to see that tools like Ansible and Terraform have won the battle to win the hearts and minds of customers over what the vendors were telling them. That's not something that happens all the time. That's something that happens fairly rarely in that it's a groundswell movement, not, um, you know, because the vendors have money and influence and resources and the ability to change people, like to send salespeople out with a message. Yes. And they literally told customers, don't use Ansible, don't use Salt Stack. We've got an, you know, we've got an SDN platform, blah, blah, blah. Um, and now five years later, I think the interesting part about Ansible and Terraform is A, we've converged on these two tools. Other tools like Salt Stack and Puppet seem to have faded away to some extent. They haven't kept the momentum going. So strategically, it's interesting to see that this is where we are in the market and um, that you're now at a mature point where there's really only two products to choose from and they're different products. So, you know, mm -hmm. we'll probably touch on the difference between Terraform and Ansible at some point. But it is an it's interesting to me that Ansible survived, beat off all the others sort of thing. And Terraform has come from and has come past Puppet and Salt Stack and other orchestra, you know, CF Engine and a bunch of others 
to to dominate the cloud orchestration piece. So that strategic stuff interests me a lot. But I don't know if you guys have got any thoughts. And to build on top of that, uh, within the uh, the Cisco DevNet certifications, they are specifically in their blueprints calling out Ansible and Terraform on top of their their product suite that they have right of NSO. And so to be mentioned in their in the study plans, I think gives more credence to that exact thought. Hmm. That really makes sense do, in the context of NSO. Uh, NSO being, it, it started out as a multi-vendor tool that based on modeling and so on. So it fits really well uh, in this context, whereas some of the other tools in Cisco's yeah. world, maybe not so much, but NSO, yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, you're making a good point there, Ethan. That is, um, Cisco's a big company, has a lot of different vertical business units, and some of them love Ansible and some of them hate it. So you hmm. can't, um, is, is the truth, right? Let's be truth. And some of them are like, oh, really? Is that what customers want? Oh, wow. You know, um, and it does vary according to what customers want. So service provider customers are more Ansible inclined and you might see the service provider products reflect that customer demand. Whereas if you go out into the campus stuff, Ansible's kind of spelt DNA center or SD <laughs> campus. Right? And uh, <laughs> so it's not, it don't and, and this applies to a lot of vendors and it applies to different products and blah 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 so it is also fair to say that ansible hasn't been a stunning success it's been a a modest success often limited to just the data center and nothing else mm. to to put a little cloudy perspective on this one thing that i noticed is microsoft when they developed their new certifications for like devops engineer they included both Terraform and Ansible in tools that you at least need to know something about in that exam. And I thought that was telling. So in the same way that the DevNet is including Ansible, Microsoft is also including it in their exams. AWS, of course, is not because AWS doesn't include anything that's not them or often acknowledge anything that's not them. But that's, you know, <laughs> its own thing. we don't need to talk about that. Uh, well, I remember thing, other I, companies that I remember companies that used to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Bay> <laughs> networks <laughs> cisco <laughs> early cisco training programs were always yeah. like yeah there's only one type of ethernet switch it's the cisco switch you know the cisco cat right. yeah and so on yeah <laughs>